Hey, it's Jeremiah Dowdy from Field to Plate here in Southern California. I just want to thank uh, JP and Dave for having me on Pro Talk Outdoors. It's been a blast. I can't wait to do it again. That's what I call Pro Talk. When you really don't know the answer, you just make it up. My rut is that I am in a rut. To get the pilot of Red Arrow going. There's really a way to skip class. I want to say, hey, those boys right there are entertainers. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. <laughs> That's the nicest thing anybody's ever said on this podcast. Alex Rutledge here with American Roots Outdoors TV. Hey, this is Leanne Tiffany Lukowski from the Crest TV. Hi, I'm Don Higgins. This is Jeff Lindsay. Hey, everybody, this is Mark Dury with Dury Outdoors. Hey, this is Craig Fitz of Trained Assassins TV. You're listening to Dave and JP on Pro Talk Outdoors, the craziest two I know. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Pro Talk Outdoors. JP and Dave back for another episode this week. And uh, if you've listened in recent weeks, I mentioned that I had actually harvested a hog. And uh, one of the, the best parts, really, to me, the best part about any Wild Game Harvest is the meat that you get out of it. Everybody that's listened to this show for any amount of time knows how crazy I am about that. But normally I have a processor that handles most of that for me. You know, I'll do some minor cuts after I get it back. But for the most part, I'm leaving the grunt work to, to somebody else. Well, you're not unlike anybody else, JP. I mean, most people, uh, I don't know, I shouldn't even say most. I don't know. It seems like of the hunters that I know in my inner circle, I should say, mostly... 75% of them, they, you know, they get a deer, they take it to the processor, you know, and, and a lot of people, I think, in our area do well, that I, I same thing. I found a really good one now, like a really yeah, good one. Yeah, and there's great processors out there, and this is not meant to sound like, you know, you shouldn't take your, your deer to a processor or your, your wild game to a processor, but I try to, when it's conducive and the temperatures are right and I can, you know, actually do it and you have the time. I try to process the deer myself, you know, and it saves money, and it's kind of nice to know you're the only one that touched that animal from the time that it was harvested to the time it reaches the plate. Yep. And that's kind of nice to know. 100%, and, you know, I wish I was more self-sufficient on that, and uh, part of getting that way is educating yourself, and when I got that wild boar back, they quartered it for me down there. I had it quartered and, and brought it back in a cooler, and I was left to make my own cuts. I did a serviceable job, but not a good job, in my opinion. Uh, you know, the, the meat still tastes good, but I don't know enough about making the cuts. And it's different for each species that you might be processing. And you, you got to have the right tools, the no, you know, the wherewithal, the, the knowledge to just do it. And uh, it's a big step to get from novice to somebody who's good with a knife. I mean, there's even technique to it. So essentially what we're going to do this episode is bring on a former guest who talked a little bit about that kind of stuff in his past appearance in Jeremiah Dowdy. And the last time we spoke to him on this podcast from Field to Plate was a, uh, a, a successful page and following, but not to the degree that it is now. Man, old Jeremiah done blown up. He has blown up. And for good reason. I mean, he's uh, he's doing things that uh, that are very admirable, and he's sending out a message to everyone that there's nothing better than you know harvesting your own meat and eating clean, wild, organic meat that yep. you know exactly where it comes from. You don't have to worry about um, all the different hands that touch it and all the different places that meat goes, or where did it come from? Did it sit on some kind of loading dock for you know 12 hours in the hot sun and you don't even know about it i mean those things happen mm -hmm. and we're going to ask him some questions to get a basic beginner thesis or idea just as to how you can get started and do that kind of thing yourself but do it amongst several species and we're going to talk to jeremiah right after this you're listening to pro talk outdoors <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Terry Peer from Real Wildlife Products, and hopefully by now you've heard of our new product called Maximizer Pro Formula Complete Feed and Attractant. This product came on the market in January after a lot of testing that I did here in Kentucky. And when we first started testing this product, I was amazed at the palatability and the consumption rate in something that can be so healthy for a deer. So for those of you doing supplemental feed programs or using uh, products for an attractant, this is the product you need to try. 
And we can talk about how much research we've done, but instead we're going to let you hear from one of our customers that went out and purchased some of this product to use on their property. This is Josh Anderson from Lethal Mission in the Southeast. So I have been, uh, well, for the past past few weeks, I have been using the um, Maximizer Complete feed from Real World Wildlife Products, and it has absolutely just blew me away, um, specifically on a little 20-acre piece of property that, uh, that we picked up. I, um, when I first got access to the property, I went in and poured out a bag of corn, and that bag of corn lasted, I think, two weeks, and then I got my order of, of the complete feed from Real World and went in and poured a bag of corn, and just the pictures tripled. Um, the deer numbers multiplied, uh, the feed lasted about three days and every picture I got, there was five to six does. I think we had 10 different bucks, um, eating this complete feed and it just, I mean, it totally blew me away. Um, everything just destroyed. And what I liked about it was the complete feed has the mineral in it. And what I found out was, you know, after these deer ate it all up off the ground, they were still coming to it and still hitting that dirt where the mineral was kind of sifted into the ground. And, uh, you know, a lot of times after your, after your feed's gone, the deer, they might come back in, but they're just going to check it. And uh, these deer, they were still hitting it. And I was super excited about this product. It has, I mean, when you open it up and see it, you can tell that, that this, this can make a difference. Um, and not only attracting deer, but growing deer, holding deer, and it, like I said, it just it, it blew me away with the um, the quick time that the deer found it, and deer that you know were not used to it, and still coming back for more. They're hammering, hammering, and hammering it. Thanks, Josh. And for more information or to purchase this product, you can go to Real World Wildlife Products website at www.realworldwildlifeproducts.com. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to Pro Talk Outdoors. As promised, we've got the mastermind behind from field to plate, Jeremiah Dowdy on the show. And, and Jeremiah, number one, thanks for coming on for a second time. And, and number two, man, you have blown up since the last time we had you on. Well, first, thank you. And second, yeah, I don't, and I don't get why. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I think we get why. I, I think it has something to do with all that delicious food you take pictures of. Well, that's... To me, that's the hope and that's the prayer that people like, you know, like the food I put out because that's what we're eating in our house. So I have to say that that to me, I mean, it, your stuff was always quality, but it just seems like your photos are getting better and better and better and more creative. And I, I don't know, I feel like we have a fairly visual society, so I, I feel like you're hooking a lot of people with the photos, but that's just me with a shot in the dark. Well, yeah, no, I, and it's my whole thing is the more I realize, you know, that you eat with your eyes first and and if I can if I can make food look appetizing, I get I I mean I even get vegans commenting now like man I wish I ate meat because that looks delicious. <laughs> um, so it's all taking the time to prep it. And again, you know whatever I make for that picture is what my wife eats for dinner. So the prettier the plate, the happier she is. So oh, so she she's definitely into the aesthetics of it then. Oh yeah, I mean when I first started this full time, she said hey you can go full time on this, but all the pictures that you post of your food that's the plate that I eat for dinner. So, that's a win-win, man. That's a that's pretty a, good deal. That's a great hey, deal. I, I'm not going to complain if all i got to do is make her plate look pretty. The girls get upset sometimes because they're like, why isn't our plate so pretty? I'm like, Cause I only got to make one plate look pretty for, for pictures. So. <laughs> yeah, Daddy don't want to work overtime today. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, if man, you want to learn how to do it yourself, I'll teach you. Oh, so. that's, that's so awesome. Uh, the, <laughs> in the opening segment, we were talking a little bit about uh, – harvesting different game species and and i was fortunate enough a couple weeks ago to harvest a, a russian boar and I, I mentioned my novice when it comes to processing my own meat in the first place and then i go from a species like deer that i'm more familiar with to a hog which i'm even less familiar with and the challenge that i found myself you know in that moment feeling a little bit in over my head and at that point in time i knew i wanted to have you back on the show because i, I can't be the only person that's encountered this if they've gone on a you know like a bucket list kind of hunt and managed to have some success so i want to ask you what is the best way for an average joe like myself to be prepared to process 
multiple species of animal because to me it's not all the same. It's apples and oranges. Uh, I think I think if you actually look at ninety percent of four legged critters, they are all exactly the same. Okay. Um, from a, I mean, you can the, the the way that I process a deer is the same way I process a squirrel. Um, they all have the same characteristics. All four legged critters have those back straps, those back legs, those tenderloins, those front shoulders. But it's understanding how to get the proper cuts because the cuts That's you're getting it. off of a yeah, the cuts you're getting off a deer are not the same cuts that you want when you're getting a a hog, you know. That, and see, I you, got, that's what I you mean. Want that, yeah, yeah. You want that picnic roast. You want that ham. You want where a deer, you're cutting up that back ham because you want a, a roast and a and steaks. But for a, a wild pig, people want to do a whole ham, and it's it is it, it is very hard um, when it comes to that because again, people want to learn, but they don't want to take the time to do it. And that's that's the biggest thing I found is is the people that really want to learn, really want to take the time. And really want to sit there and I mean I had a buddy come over to our house you know he killed a pig and brought over to my house it's like okay show me I was like all right dude and we just sat in my house and we broke down you know he's I'm like oh what do you want he's like I want bone and pork chops I want you know rum you know I want one ham I want one ham steaks I want and so we sat there and broke this down and he goes that was a lot easier than I thought because once you understand the mechanics of it and understand what the animal looks like it's it's easier you know, I, but I say that because I've broken down. I mean, this season alone, I think I broke down like 39 deer. So <clears throat> now I can do it in my sleep. But I think the first thing is is not being afraid to mess up and not being afraid to ask questions of those before you. Uh, cause especially in our society, people are so afraid to ask for help because they might seem like they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I guess that kind of. But not, but in all reality, you don't know what you're doing, so ask for help. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that exactly hits the spot right there. What you just said, because it, it's, I mean, I've been there just whenever I started trying to process my own deer. You, I mean, some of the stuff is elementary. It's you know, you know about you skinning it out, and you know about if you're going to quarter it up, you know about getting the loins out. But past that. It's like how I know you 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 have to be not afraid to make mistakes, but you don't want to destroy an animal that you just harvested. You want to make sure that you don't do anything to screw up. So I guess what do you, what kind of advice can you give to somebody so they don't mess up? I mean, what's the mistakes they can make after they get past that point? Uh, I think when I was learning how to butcher, the the old timer that was teaching me he. Because I, I said the same thing. Like, dude, I don't want to ruin this. You know, I shot this. I don't want to ruin it. And he laughed and said, it's just another meatball. And I really kind of took that to heart is even if I mess up, it's still food. You know, I can still make something delicious out of it. But I think is is taking taking your time to do your research and, and look at – I mean, I go, I go back and read old butchering videos or, uh, you know, not videos, magazines and books from like – the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s because they're so detailed. And it, it, and it isn't YouTube with some, you know, redneck that I can't understand with a knife I can't afford cutting up a, a ham. It's a real timer with, like, detailed pictures of how to break down a deer and what cuts to get out of it. And for me, like, my big thing that I'm, I'm focusing on is getting getting more fancier cuts out of my deer this year or this upcoming season. And so what I've been doing is I've been looking at how can I get – a T-bone steak out of my deer. Oh my! And so what I'm doing is I'm watching uh, I'm watching videos of guys professionally butcher down cows, and then I'm just going to shrink that down. And I mean, the the T-bone steak's only going to be you know a nine ounce steak because of the way that deer are made. But I'm researching and I'm wanting to advance my my thought process, and so I'm diving headfirst into this. I mean, I I on my website you know on my computer right now. I have this picture from 1963 of this of this guy, you know, processing out a T-bone steak. And it's all in black and white, but I'm sitting there looking at how he's cutting this and I'm understanding the mechanics behind it. And I guarantee you I'm going to screw it up on a couple deer before I get it right, just like Frenching out and, and cutting steaks and stuff like that. But I think the cool thing about it is if I mess up, nobody has to know because I'm still going to eat it. Well, and I, I think... And I think that's where I look at it is just have fun, man, because if we're so scared to mess up, then we're not going to even try to mess up, you know? 
ab- absolutely. And I, trust me, I messed up plenty that night. I mean, I, I made some, some bad, bad mistakes, and I, I wouldn't even know how to define them. I can just look at them and tell them, yeah, that, 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 that's that, doesn't, that doesn't look right. What, but, <laughs> what cuts were you? What cuts were you trying to get out of it? Well, here's the thing. I, I took the front, uh, the two front shoulders, and I dedicated that to make for sausage. Now, you, I, I would love your opinion on that if you think that's a mistake or not. But uh, that... on pigs, on pigs, yeah, you want sausage out of the back. Okay. Out of the butt. Okay. We'll uh, see. There, that was my first mistake. <laughs> so... Yeah, shoulders on shoulders on wild hogs. They're they're fighting and. and and hitting so hard that they're really there's really not too much meat on them, mm-hmm. um, but they smoke really really well. Okay. Um, and they 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 crock pot really really well. They shred really well. Okay. Um, but as as for sausages, you're gonna get a tougher cut of meat, or a tougher sausage with those front shoulders than you are using them. You know, designating one whole rear quarter. Okay. When I when I usually do my wild hog, I usually do half the pig for my primary cuts, mm-hmm. and then the other half the pig for my sausages. And grinds and stuff like that. Okay. So I get so I get that one full you know ham out of it. I'll get my you know half bone in pork chops, which come out of your back strap on a pig. Um, that's where your your loin on a pig is coming from the back strap. They do have those inner loins, just like a deer. Um, but that's not what you're getting your pork chops out of. There's a misconception that a lot of people have. You are getting your pork chop cuts out of that back strap. And then front shoulder, usually you can get two steaks off that front shoulder. Uh, and I usually will pound those out and make schnitzel or do something along that line with it, roll it in something. And then you can still render down – I mean, pig fat's good fat, even on wild boars. So you can always render down that fat or use that fat and sausage and that kind of stuff too. So, Well, that was my first mistake. I dedicated the, the wrong parts to the wrong thing. <laughs> but I, I did. I did take one of the hams. And I have it set aside, frozen, and, and wrapped, vacuum sealed, all that for smoking on the grill. So since that one is in good shape and, and ready to roll, how would you go about smoking one of the back legs for a grill like that? I mean, what what's the best method, the best brine? What's your theory behind it? I think it all depends on what you're going for. If you're going for like a you know like a honey roast ham type deal, there's different marinades and grill you know grill techniques and smoking techniques that you can do and curing times. I mean, if you want to cure a ham, it, it can take weeks um, of cure. Or you can do, you know, simply put it on there and, you know, inject it with some really good butters and sauces and flavors and then throw it on, on the grill until it reaches its, you know, 165 degrees, pull it and slice it. It's phenomenal. Uh, I think it all just kind of depends on where you're going with it and, and what kind of recipe you want to make with them. I mean, Easter's coming up, so doing Easter ham would be a killer concept to do with it. You know, that's funny that you mentioned that, because that's actually what I was thinking a little bit about. Uh, I, I just, I enjoy the whole culinary process, and I don't know, I, I had a feeling like if I made the ham this year for the family gathering I go to and made it out of that wild harvest, maybe I'd get some more people on board with going out on some trips and, and, and things of that nature. So, yeah, I mean, if you were to do something like that, ham style for Easter, what uh, what steps would you take? Uh, I think first would be kind of trimming it up, making it look, making it look pretty, making it look uh, effective, and then, um, and then looking at the flavor profile behind it and getting getting the brine ready, mm-hmm. and getting your. I mean, I use usually it's like salt, cure salt, honey, and pickling spices. Really? Is what you're is what you're averaging going to do on that? And your cure salt, man, you can get any cure salt from from Amazon, and you can get a bag of like, you know, pink cure salt for ten bucks or something like that, and it'll last you. I throw it in all my sausages that I smoke. Uh, I also throw it in any of my ground jerky that I do, just to be safe because I like to eat it more on the tender side. Uh huh. Um, yeah, and then just brine that brine that sucker up. Uh, you can do it for uh, a couple days. Kind of just depends on how you do it. Usually, my whole thing is four to five days. Um, or if you talk to a lot of butchers, they say a pound, you know, a pound a day per pound. So okay. if it's a five pound, five five pound hawk, you're doing a five day brine on it, and then r- remove that from the brine, rinse it all off. Um, you can, if you're going to do an oven roast, you can put it in the oven, and you're going to, you know, cook it that way. You want to make sure that that internal temp reaches. 
155 is pork, but I always try to go 165, 170 ish, you know, uh, on wild boar just for trigonosis. You don't know what they're eating. Right. Uh, but domestic pork, trig is pretty much by the wayside now. Um, but the wild boars, you still, you still watch it. But I like to throw it in the smoker and just maintain that temperature and let it smoke and baste it in honey. Usually I'll do like brown sugar, honey, some orange juice and make a mixture. And then every, you know, 20 minutes I'll baste the whole ham in that and let that crystallize and caramelize on the outside. That so may be the like winner. That. that may be the winner. You may have sold me right there. And it's, it's great. Cause you'll build this, this crust around it. Um, and you can even baste the front cause you're going to have an open part of that ham where you cut it off from, right. the, you know, the, the leg and you can even, you know, continually base that too to kind of build that crust to, to maintain the moisture and but your biggest thing is you want to keep it moist so the brine's going to help with that injecting it is going to help with that and again it just injecting it with you know apple cider vinegar or apple juice or orange juice or whatever flavor profile you're going for you don't got to get fancy now and then just watch just watch that temperature usually now and you i smoke it at about 180 you know, the temperature of the smoker, 180 to 200 is what I'll keep the smoker at. Now, have you ever smoked a, a wild hog bone-in before? Do you always cut your meat off of the bone? No, I've done bone-in. I've done I've done whole wild wild hogs bone-in. Just I've even I've even dehaired them and done like a Hawaiian you know pit style with wild boar before. Um, I'm not worried about the bones at all, and they actually add killer flavor and help keep the the meat moist. That's yeah. That was kind of my thought. Was if I did go the smoking route, I kind of wanted to to keep that bone in there just to see how it did. But uh, I I do want to back up just a couple steps. And and you were talking about reading magazine articles and just staying informed and and learning more about it due to the detail. And you you mentioned the idea of you know a bad YouTube video and it not really teaching you a whole lot. So how can somebody like myself, who is a novice, go out to YouTube and find something that's quality and, and know that it's quality? I mean, do you look based on ratings or views, or how can you tell what you're looking at is good, accurate information? I think the first thing is the guy is, is the guy talking all about himself or is he talking about the meat? Uh, you, it's surprising. Go watch some of these bad YouTube videos. It's all about, this is the way that I do it. And then you watch those good butchers, and they're like, hey, this is the way the butchering does it. And it takes that the me and the I out of it. And I've noticed that the videos that are not focused around making that person famous are the ones that are really, really good, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, it's focused on the animal, not the person trying to make right. them and a it, hero for doing it right. Right. And, and look at a video, too. If it's how to butcher a, a pig and it's a nine-minute video, eh, who knows, you know? That might be a good video, but if it's a you know if it's a thirty minute video on how to how to you know debone a back hawk, well thirty minutes to how to de- it's going to be a pretty detailed video, and you can tell in the first five minutes if it's going to be a good video or not. You don't need to waste waste your time. I mean, on YouTube alone, they say that there's only like I think it's like the average watch time is a minute fifty nine seconds on YouTube, and it's crazy to think about. But the fact is, is that if if it's a good video. After that two minutes, you're still going to be intrigued, and you're still going to want to learn. Um, me personally, this this next season, I've already I've already pulled on a guy who's going to be my, my video guy, and I'm gonna. My goal is to do a detailed butcher on every single animal this year that I harvest, from a turkey to a quail to a deer to an elk. That is um, an excellent idea. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So it's going to be, and it'll be broken down into literal, like this is how you break down a back leg. And then this is how you break down the parts of that back leg that you broke down. So it's, it'll be even each video is only going to be five minutes long, but it's going to be once you break the you know break down all the muscle groups. Now how do you make this muscle group usable and this muscle group usable? So for you who's like, hey, I know how to take off back straps, I know how to take off front shoulders, but I'm lost when it comes to cutting steaks on the rear quarter. You can just go click. That's me. You know, That's me for steaks. sure. And you're just going to learn how to cut ribeye steaks. You're not going to learn how to cut the whole deer because you already know it all, but you want to learn how to cut ribeye. And, you know, in, in wild turkey, it's like guys ask me all the time, hey, I just pressed out my turkeys, and I, but you're utilizing the whole bird. So I've already got I – mean, I'm working with the NWTF this year. We're filming a show uh, in Missouri in April um, where we're going to go hunt, you know, in Missouri for wild turkey. I've got something lined up for wild turkey to hunt Rio's in Texas something to hunt Rio's in California and all those are going to be filmed. All those will be documented on, on how to utilize your bird better and how to make a wing bone call 
how to make, you know, jewelry for your kids and for your wife and your spouses and, and yourself and how to use the wings for decorations and how to use the wings to make wing calls. And there's all these other things that you can do to utilize it. And I think that's, that's my next avenue because I've been teaching. And like you said, I've kind of exploded, not really trying to, it's just my food is good. My pictures are great, but now I got to teach people how to do it. And I've just, I mean, again, living in Southern California, it's really hard because I can't go out and just go in my backyard to a beautiful setting. I mean, I go to my backyard and you can hear the freeway and you can hear the fire trucks and you, the helicopters fly over. And so I'm, I have to travel to film. That's why it's harder for me to do it. Um, but it will be this next season. It's, it's all going to be about filming and documenting so that I can build up a YouTube present so people can sit there and say, Hey, how, Hey, how do I French out a, you know, a deer rack? And it's going to be a video on just how to do it. It's not going to be me, you know, BSing and talking about myself. I might, in some of the videos, I'm not even going to talk. It's just going to be me cutting with music in the background because you don't need to hear my voice to know how to cut a steak, you know? I tell you what, Jeremiah, since you brought up turkeys, and that's kind of the, the season that's upon us here, I mean, I know a couple of us are actually going out to uh, northwest Nebraska in uh, at the end of March for their archery-only season, and hopefully we're going to kill some birds there. So what can we do, um, you know, being away from home, um, and to to process those turkeys, or, or how should we handle processing those turkeys? Let's just say we get out there and we kill a couple of birds, and we want to get those birds home, but we want to make sure we utilize everything we can with that bird. What's what's our best plan of attack there? Uh, I'm at quarter them out. Uh, if you I mean, cut out what I usually do with my birds when I travel with them, um, you know, I got I got my my, my hopper that I throw stuff in. I can throw I mean, in, in, in the Yeti hopper, I'm not sponsored by Yeti. I'm just telling you what I have and what I use. Um, I mean, I could fit two whole birds in that in that hopper and bring them home when they're completely either plucked or deboned. But your biggest thing is if, if you don't want to spend the time to pluck it because you've got a couple birds and you're really not going to roast a whole bird, I mean, skin the sucker out like you would a pheasant or, or a dove. You know, Pull all the skin off the entire thing so now it looks like a chicken or like a turkey. You'd get Thanksgiving with skin off. And then what I do is I cut the back the the backbone out, like you would snap cotch a chicken. So cut the backbone out, you lay it down flat, and then you can go right between that breastplate and split the bird completely in half. Now you've got the bird completely in half. You've got breast on one, thigh and leg and wing on one. The other one you have the same exact thing. Now that bird can stack on top of each other, and you can actually fit three full birds in a cooler until you get home and time to process it. But the biggest thing is don't throw away those thighs and legs, man. They make I think thighs and legs are better tasting than a breast by far. And I see so many guys that travel. It's like, oh, I, I don't have the space for it. You have the space for it. Um, even if you just cut off that thigh and that leg together, you have the space for it. And you're going to get – this year alone, I, I, I did a thing for NWTF last season where I took a whole bird and I cooked all the different parts. And out of the two thighs and legs on a 20-pound tom, it was like six and a half pounds of, of meat that I got off of it. Let me I mean, ask you this. Yeah, uh, That's a lot of meat. Yeah, it is. I know last year with uh, the bird I killed, I saved the legs and the thighs. And I I actually, um, I put the I just put the legs on the grill, you know, and kind of did them drumstick style. And the thing was, it was delicious, but there's so many, like, uh, of those thin bones. Tendons. Yeah, I, I guess yeah, they're, they're tendons. tendons. Yeah, they, they, they were almost like bones, you know, whenever they come off the grill. How can you, um, I guess, get around those, or what's the best way to process those legs so that you don't have to continue you, biting into those things? If you, I mean, I always tell everybody, man, throw those, throw those legs in a crock pot, throw your favorite seasonings or a hunk of garlic or whatever you got in there, and braise those down until they fall off the bone. Because what happens is, as you cook it, those tendons turn hard like like a bone, like a rock. Right. Like exactly like you were saying. But the best part about it is when you shred that meat off that, it falls right off all those tendons and all those bones. Um, and so now you've got all this meat and you've got all these tendons and bones that you can use for stocks or throw away, and you have 100% usable shredded meat. And that meat, man, I use. I make shredded tamales. I make tacos. We do tacos out of it. I'll do soups and stews out of that meat because you have this beautiful shredded, flavorful, dark meat that is just insane 
But I think the problem that a lot of people get is they try to grill it or they try to cook it like you get at Disneyland or the fair. Um, and the, the problem is those birds are sitting in a pen and our wild birds are running, flying, jumping, kicking, scratching. They need so tendons. They need, a, they need tendons. They're not these fat. They're, they're not. They're not these fat, plump birds that just sit there like oh, I'm good. Um, but yeah, slow, slow roasting those suckers down until the meat falls off is, to me, the absolute best way to do it. And it's, I mean, it's my daughter's favorite way. We'll sit there, and as soon as it comes off, man, they're just like in the crock pot, fingers in it. I'm like, back off. Um, but they're just mouthful of this wild turkey meat. Now, it's just you, absolutely insane. I know they t it tastes amazing. You know, it really does. I, um, the meat is just, it's so flavorful. Do you, uh, when you put them in the cooler, like you mentioned, do you do that the same way you do the rest of your, you know, your species when you quarter them? Do you do the ice bath and all that kind of stuff for a, a no, bird? No, no. Birds usually know. They don't have that. You're not really trying to get all that blood out of them because they're not covered in it. And right. Especially if you're like, if you're archery hunting, you might want to, you know, rinse off those, you know, that breast where you, where you pin the bird, that kind of stuff. If you're not going for the head, you're going for that, that wing shot in, in the heart. Um, but no, with, with birds, not at all. Just especially with the way that their, their guts and everything are sat and their gullets and all that stuff. As long as you rinse them off real good so and you put them on ice in, in a cooler, they're, they're perfect to sit there for a couple days, especially aging birds is not a bad thing at all. So now, do you put them directly on the ice, or do you have like a layer of plastic in between it, or how do you go about no, that? No, I'll just I'll just throw them on the ice. That doesn't bother okay. me. Okay. It's not going to burn them. I mean, especially if you're just you know you're traveling home for a couple of days, it's not gonna it's not gonna harm them. They're not gonna sit on there forever. I mean, you can even if you have a vacuum sealer, vacuum seal them and throw them in there. I mean, it's it's not that you know it's not that bad. Or throw them in a ziploc if you're concerned. It's not it's not going to do any damage to them. But if people are concerned with it. You know, there are options to, to throw that in. I mean, Glad makes bags that you can put, like, beach balls in. That I mean, I I put whole turkeys inside those and roll them up and tape them and then throw them in, a, you know, an ice chest sometimes. I if, guess I don't I was, pluck, if I don't want to pluck them or something like that. I guess I was just curious, you know, more so for the guy on the four-day trip, such as northwest Nebraska, and if he kills on the first yeah. day, he's got three three days of hunting and then a day and a half of travel after that. Yeah, it's not gonna. I mean, throw it on ice. It's not gonna. It's not gonna do anything with it. Good deal. I mean, it's yeah. It's it's completely. And it, even if if you don't want to, if you gut, if you skin that whole bird, quarter it out, and then keep that keep that bird whole until the last day when you're breaking everything down, you can literally pack that entire chest cavity full of ice, um, and then throw it in the ice chest. And now it's not only is it cooling from the inside, it's cooling from the outside also. And you know, and that's I've done that many of times with birds where I'm traveling. Sometimes I'll, I'll hunt in Northern California, which is 11 hours, and I'm driving home, and I'll take that whole bird, and I will just pack the, the whole thing full of ice and then throw it in my cooler and pour ice over it because now I'm not, I'm not worried about anything. I know that for a fact that bird's going to stay ice cold on the 11-hour drive home or, or even like, like last, last season, I shot a bird opening day, and I was hunting until Monday, and that was on a Saturday and I hunted until Monday, then I drove home on Tuesday, and I got home, and that bird still had ice in the cavity. So, it's I'm not worried about it as long as it's keeping that that temperature. You're you're fine. You're totally fine. Think about a grocery store. I mean, those birds, they're not just getting to the grocery store that day. They've been in that package for weeks. You know. Right. No. Yeah. No, that's no doubt. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's one thing that people don't think about. How long has that meat been sitting around before you actually buy it off a shelf? Well, Which is disgusting to think about. Don't, don't oh, yeah. if you're listening right now, don't think about that. Just hunt your own food because then, because then you always know. Exactly. <laughs> and one more subject I, I want to bring up before we let you go, man. Uh, it's the tools you use. And, and to me, again, this may be silly of me to think, but it feels to me like the the tools you use to process and quarter or anything with this meter is a really important thing. Not only do you want a sharp knife, but you want the right kind of knife, correct? I mean, what does a novice such as myself need to be sure he has in his kitchen or his shop, wherever he's doing his processing? Uh, I think the, the biggest thing is, like you said, it's, it's a sharp knife. And a knife that's going to maintain that sharpness. I mean, I always, people laugh at me, but as soon as I sit there starting doing deer, I pull out you know, a sharpening block, a sharpening rod. And they're like, dude, but your knife. I said, I mean, I will, I will cut, sharpen, cut, sharpen, cut, sharpen. Because the sharper the knife, the, the easier it cuts. The cleaner it cuts, the nicer it cuts. Um, 
I'm a selfish plug here for a company that I've used since the beginning of time. Uh, Avalon's coming out with a new, like, long type nine inch scimitar blade. And I use like a nine inch blade on all my butchering. And I am super excited because it's super flexible. It's super thick. Um, it's made for fishing. And I laughed. And they're like, yeah, I know you're going to use it for hunting. I was like, yep, I am. And it's that's a cheap alternative to going out and spending, you know, I have a. I, the knife I use is like 490 bucks. Um, so going out and uh, tell, telling a, a novice hunter, hey, go, you can go spend 500 bucks on a blade. It's just, to me, it's stupid. I'm not, I'm not ever going to do it. Um, but mine was made for me personally as a gift, and I absolutely love it. But if you can't, I mean, Browning makes some good, some good long, you know, butchering blades. Um, you can go to Walmart. I mean, Mossy Oak is coming out with a whole new line of stuff from all processing gear like i've been talking to them and it's kind of come from from knives to grinders to vacuum sealers to dehydrators to everything they're coming out they're they're pairing up with weston and they're coming up with a whole new line of mossy oak gear which is going to be phenomenal um so yeah i think our industry is really changing and it's exciting to see companies jump on board and create products um and then i get to be a part of it because they're, they're sitting there going well would you use this and i'm like nope okay, well, what can we use, you know, what can we make that you would use? And it's it's cool to kind of see that that process. But, yeah, I would say that the biggest thing is a sharp knife and watch your fingers with sharp knives because <laughs> – They're not forgiving. That, <laughs> no, one slip – I mean, I, I'm a professional, what, what people call me, and I I mean, I always get cut. So just be careful with, with that knife. But, yeah, just find yourself a sharp knife and don't don't be afraid to, you know, to spend 100 bucks on a knife. Because that knife is going to save you so much time and so much effort and so much money in the long run than taking it to a processor. Um, but yeah, again, don't be scared to to make a mistake. And again, I've always said it, and I'll say it again, my social media is always open. I have a 100% response rate. I will always answer questions. I will always help anybody out that needs it. Uh, my line is always open. So anyone listening that has a question about it, just reach out. There's no dumb question except for the one not asked. So. Well, that's a perfect bridge right there. I know you mentioned earlier uh, some of the new things you're going to be doing with video this year. What is the best place for people to keep up with that kind of thing and, and follow you as you develop this career? I mean, from field to plate on everything, from from fieldtoplate.com, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter is from field, the number two plate, because apparently I use I have too many characters <laughs> and I have one too many. Uh, but, yeah, all those all those platforms I've got, uh, I've got some classes coming up actually that in the, in November where I did this last year, it was actually an article written in outdoor life in February. You should check it out. But, uh, I had a whole class on how to, how to go, you know, become a, a hunter and a butcher and a, and a chef all in three days where I brought people out that had never picked up a gun before ever. And they ended up shooting a deer and then taught them how to gut skin clean, uh, butcher 100% themselves. They butchered their deer, took home all the meat, but, in the process at, at the ranch, we, I taught them how to cook any meal that they wanted and we grilled and we made some phenomenal dishes cause they had questions and I'll be doing that again this year and hopefully I can have another 20 people go to it. But it was, it was exciting to see people get excited about wanting to get outside, wanting to do it and wanting to get their hands dirty for their dinner. It's, it's cool. Awesome. Well, I know we've enjoyed following you over the last year and a half or so since we've, uh, ran along and saw what you were into and I know I'm really looking forward to the future as well I, I'm most excited over these videos I won't lie I wish these were already out I, do I, I too. would watch it tonight absolutely <laughs> I, I need the help tremendous idea yeah. thank you yeah I wish I I wish I had the, you know a magic wand to wave it and be like done but it's so much time and effort and work to, to do it and do it correctly because there's so many like, like I said there's so many out there and I want to do it where it's it can be the one go to that people can feel excited about it and feel comfortable about it. And, and a non-hunter be able to go to the video and click on it and feel the respect towards that animal, feel the honor towards that animal, and then feel like they can go do it. Because a lot of these videos, even I watch, I'm like, there's no way I can do that. And I'm, a, I'm really good with, with my knife. But, again, the, the, the fancy terminology, nobody cares. You'll never hear me you know, throw out some fancy term on how to cut because it doesn't matter. It this is how you cut it. It doesn't matter what it's called. So I'm excited that you guys are excited. I'm excited to hopefully put those out beginning of next hunting season. I've got 
got a couple ranches that have already given me the, the space. I just need to go and film it. So, Jeremiah, before we let you go, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't didn't mention this because you, you just kind of brought it up about uh, the process that you went through about bringing people into the sport and and teaching them how to not only hunt but take care of the animal and take it from field to plate. I know that uh, at times there's a lot of negativity out there, and I think you, you're the, the brunt force of a lot of that. You receive a lot of that, uh, a lot of hate messages and things like that from from non-hunters or anti-hunters. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what we as hunters or the in the uh, in the hunting industry can do to send more of a positive message out there and, and kind of bridge that gap? Because I feel like that a lot of people that are – uh, not hunters, or maybe even on the fence, or, or even call themselves anti-hunters, they just don't understand the the care and the thought and the love that we as hunters have for actually taking care and the responsibility of harvesting our own food. I think the biggest thing we need to start with is stop fighting amongst each other. Um, that's huge right now. Is there's so many so many people that are fighting against each other in this industry from being an archer to a rifle hunter to a bow hunter to a shotgun hunter, or being a public land hunter or a private land hunter, or and people see that and it just adds fuel to the fire and it, it disgusts me and it really it really upsets me because I've got friends on both ends and to see them go through this stuff and to see memes being made about people in the industry uh, as funny as they are it's it's our brothers and sisters and it fuels fire for the antis because they're like look you guys can't even get it you know get on the same page but for me it's it's going at it with love and respect and going at the people if you go read any of my comments again like you said i get blasted daily i mean i got i posted a picture of this pheasant i was plucking today i had i had 17 negative you know direct messages in 10 minutes after posting this bird that i was plucking and it's just wow. plucking a bird it's not even it's not a bloody deer hanging from a stand with its tongue hanging out. It's just this looks like a chicken that I'm plucking. And what happens is if I come at it with, with anger and, and stuff like that, it gives them more fuel for their fire. But I always come at it with respect. I respect what they do. I, and you can go back and read all my comments on past posts, and you'll never see me start yelling or pointing fingers. It's always education. And I think that's the big thing we need to do is we need to educate people that this is why we do it. Um, like I said, I had I had a vegan. I, I, I took out an ex-vegan who slammed me like crazy for over a year but started following me and then asked me to take them hunting. And I was really kind of nervous at first going, okay, I'm going to take out <laughs> this guy who's trying to literally, who said he's going to murder me, and I'm going to put a gun in his hand. Um, but we went out and he harvested a deer. Um, and we went through the process of butchering down this deer and I watched this dude break down. Uh, emotionally and physically and took the first bite of his meat of meat that he had in over 10 years and now he's excited to get his kids involved in hunting because I took the time to come at him with with respect and I literally said hey man I will I will take you out and I will teach you what I do and once he saw when the animal dropped and I walked over and I blessed that animal and I prayed over that animal and I said all right man now, now we're going to take it and I showed him how to butcher that animal he goes I never knew hunting was like this hunting is what I see on TV, not what I see in real life. And if you look at our hunting, t you know, TV and videos and podcasts and I mean, some of the big podcasters out there right now, they're, they're dicks, no, you know, about everything and they're rude about stuff and they're all they're focusing in on, you know, is, is the, the drinking, the, the big racks, the hooting and hollering, the, you know, plugging this company and wearing this you know type of clothing and using this type of gun versus why we do it in the first place and I think getting back to the basics really will impact our industry for the better um, getting back to just pure authentic hunting um, someone asked me the other day like if social media went away what would I do and I said I'd live an amazing life <laughs> because I don't define myself by my social media I mean just in, like you said, in two years, 30,000 people started following me. But if that went away tomorrow, I'd still be teaching my kids how to hunt. I'd still be talking to you about hunting. I'd still be going out there filling my freezer. It doesn't affect me if I don't have a sponsor. What affects me is my family 
having to eat meat from the grocery store after seven years. That would affect me. I don't think you could have said anything more perfect than what you just said in, in response to that question, Jeremiah. I think that may have been the best three minutes we've ever had on this podcast. It very well could be. Uh, it's it's something I'm passionate about. and It's something that I tell people all the time. I'm, I'm not in it to get famous. I'm in it to teach, and I'm in it to, to impact it. And Again, walking around like SHOT Show and ATA and stuff this year and hearing the me, 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 me from people in our industry was just – it was disgusting. And I mean, I'll, I'll be out there and people know who, who they are. And I know that I get, I get slack a lot from the hunting industry because I don't fit the mold. And I'm okay with that because my mold is when my daughter last night, you know, making meatballs from scratch by herself at four years old. Like that's the mold I want to be a part of. Um, I could, I could care less if I make a million dollars because I wear a certain clothing brand. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't impact people around me positively. It might impact me and my wife and my kids, but it's not gonna. I'm not gonna be asked to be on this amazing podcast to talk about what clothing brand I wear. <laughs> that's a, so that's very true. <laughs> that's very true. Well, man, I'd like to think that the cream rises to the top, and uh, if you're not there yet, you're well on your way. Uh, I want to thank you personally for coming on the show, and I know everybody that tunes into this will enjoy it. And, and hang with us through the break, Jeremiah. This is Pro Talk Outdoors. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to Pro Talk Outdoors. Coming out of that ending of that segment, there's not a whole lot of good ways to follow that because that was an incredibly eloquent way to state not only the current uh, basis of the industry, but just exactly how everybody needs to get back to their roots. So I want to credit Jeremiah for being a a very well-spoken and thoughtful individual. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and not even the industry of of the outdoors, but just the culture the hunting culture in general right now it's um you know there's a there's a battle being waged i mean it's it's probably always been there some kind of undertone but it's it's more so now with social media being so prevalent and Mm -hmm. um and and i just don't feel like that uh, well just like jeremiah said we as hunters don't represent ourselves well enough all the time and uh, we don't think about the big picture we think about what's best for us right now and you know that's not always the best thing to be doing Well, I mean, he was just very concise but clear about the message that he wants to be a part of. And uh, if you enjoyed his soliloquy there, if you will, on on that token, then you're going to enjoy his page and you're going to enjoy the things that he posts because he's very honest, he's very forthcoming, a 100% response rate and 100% delicious recipes. You won't be disappointed there either. I want to thank Jeremiah for coming on. And until next time, hook them or hunt them, Pro Talk Outdoors. Later, guys. (laughs) Thank you.